Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown and today we'll be looking at chapter one which is an introductory chapter dealing with matter and measurement. Now chemistry as a whole is really the study of matter and the changes it undergoes and one of the core ideas behind most scientific research is really the, the concept of scientific method. And scientific method is really just a systematic way to problem solve where you make observations or come up with rudimentary experiments from which observations can be made. From those observations you look for trends or patterns and derive what would be a hypothesis. And from there you come up with ways of testing that hypothesis and if your hypothesis is upheld then you end up with a conclusion and the conclusion comes in one of two forms either a theory or a law. A law summarizes what will happen, law of conservation of mass, law of conservation of energy and so forth. A theory explains why it's going to occur, kinetic molecular theory, um, collision theory, those types of things. Now we define matter as anything that has mass and takes up space and really there is a variety of different forms in which matter comes in. Atoms are the building blocks of all matter. So no matter what it looks like at its most fundamental level, you have atoms and different types of atoms coming together. An element is basically a substance made of the same kind of atom. It could be a single atom like monatomic copper or monatomic silver or carbon. Or elements can be diatomic like the one shown in the picture here. Oxygen is one of the diatomic substances. It's elemental, uh, but it's not a single atom, so it's a diatomic, a two-atom elemental substance. And remember, you need to remember the seven diatomics, the Han Fickelbrei, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And a compound would be made up of two or more different kinds of elements put together. Now, fundamentally, classifications of matter starts with states of matter. Are you a solid, liquid, a gas? Those are our three fundamental or most basic states of matter. There are other states, but typically they're not as fundamental or important to worry about so we for the most part restrict our discussions often to gases liquids and solids and you should understand both visually and in words everything that you see in this picture here so if you need to pause the movie here and make sure you review to understand you have a core idea of both the visual representation and the words that are shown and the transitions between on, on these diagrams now, matter can be broken apart into different subcategories and this is going to be similar but different to what you probably saw in chemistry last year. Now fundamentally, matter is either uniform throughout or it's not. If it's not uniform then it's going to be a heterogeneous mixture. It's going to be a blend of different types of pure substances. Now if it is uniform throughout then it's what we call homogeneous. Notice this doesn't say homogeneous mixture. Here we're looking at the general term homogeneous. Within homogeneous there are types of homogeneous things, things that have a uniform uh, are uniform throughout. But that doesn't necessarily mean their composition is uniform. So does the homogeneous substance have a variable composition or a uniform composition? If it's not um, variable, then it's the same throughout. That would be a pure substance. If it, it does vary throughout, we have our other type of mixture, a homogeneous mixture, which another name for that would be solution. Now, within our pure substance, remember that can be divided into two subcategories based upon whether it can be separated into simpler substances chemically. If it can't, then it's elemental. If it can, then it's a compound. So these are our fundamental classifications of matter that we're going to be looking at in chemistry. Now, one of the laws that we're going to end up looking at and understanding in this very first chapter is a law of definite proportions. The elemental composition of a pure compound is always the same. This is basically saying the, the formula of water is always H2O. It's always two hydrogens to one oxygen. That's the law of definite proportions. Of the different laws we look at here at the beginning, this is really a very, it's exactly what it looks like. It's a very simple and concrete law. Now, physical properties are properties that can be observed without changing into another substance. So boiling point, density, mass, volume, every one of these things can be observed or measured and it's still going to be the same substance. Now granted, boiling is changing from a liquid to a gas, but it's still the same substance. It's just in a different state. 
So if it's still the same substance, it's a physical property. Chemical properties would be properties that can only be observed when a substance is changed into another substance. Flammability, corrosiveness, reactivity with acid, and etc. Those would be examples of chemical properties. Properties that can only be observed when the substance is changing into a new substance. Now, some properties are intensive. They're independent of the amount of substance that is present. Something like density or boiling point or color. It doesn't really matter how much you've got. That property is going to be the same. Extensive properties, on the other hand, are properties that do change upon the amount of the substance present. Mass and volume, the total amount of energy, all those things would be extensive properties of a substance. It really doesn't matter. Um, if with intensive, how much you've got, but it definitely matters with extensive properties. Now, physical change are changes in which the matter doesn't change its composition. So in other words, it's not becoming a new substance. So a change is occurring, but it's still the same substance. Change of state. We mentioned boiling before. Um, that would be an example of a physical change. Temperature, volume, changes in those things. It's going to be fundamentally the same substance. Those would be physical changes. Chemical changes, on the other hand, is things that are resulting in a new substance. Combustion, oxidation, which is um, another way of saying rusting. But in chemistry, we're going to deal with oxidation reduction reactions, decomposition, and so forth. If you remember your different types of chemical reactions from last year, those would be examples of different types of chemical changes. In the course of a chemical reaction, the reacting substances are converted into new substances. So you're breaking apart the old arrangement and reforming them into something new. Compounds can be broken down into more elemental particles. Remember, a compound, the difference between an element and a compound was whether it can be broken apart chemically. Um, Compounds can be, elemental substances can't. Now, the next thing we're going to get into here is different methods of separating mixtures. Distillation is one of the most fundamental methods of separating mixtures. It's really where you're using a difference in boiling point of the substances in the mixture to separate them into their component. So when you heat up your mixture on the left, the water has a significantly lower boiling point than the salt does. So when you get to the boiling point of the salt water mixture, the water is going to start to come across first as a gas, then it can be recooled back into a liquid. And on the far side over here, what you've collected is pure water. The salt is going to be left behind. Another type of separation technique is a simple filtration. In filtration, you're basically removing a solid from a liquid by passing it through some type of barrier. In this case, um, there is a solid that's not soluble in the liquid that's shown, probably water. And so when you pass it through the filter paper, the solid is left behind, but the liquid goes right on through. Another technique for separation is known as chromatography. And this is an example of what's known as paper chromatography. It's separating a substance really on the differences in solubility um, of the solvent and how the particles move through a medium differently. In this particular case, inside the dye, which is black at the beginning, it's actually a mixture of several different colors all blended together. As the water basically moves up the piece of paper, it picks up and carries the different types of solute particles in the dye with it, but they move through the paper at a different speed. And you can see the blue particles are moving at a much more rapid speed than the yellow and the purple particles are. And over time, you're separating based upon how they move through that medium, the paper. Next session gets into different units of measurement. Um, we typically use a form of metric. Um, which is SI units, which you remember from last year is an international system of units. The reason it's SI instead of IS is because in the French, it looks like this. So it's system international. Now there are fundamental units of measurement from which all other measurements can be derived. And these are our seven fundamental units. We pretty much use all of them throughout the course of the year except for a luminous intensity. That's one we don't use near as much. But all the rest of these are things that you need to be familiar with. And every one of these is fair game. One of the ones to watch is kilogram. A lot of times people think, oh, metric is gram, so that must mean that's the SI unit. No, it's kilogram. Now, there is a different base unit, really, for each of these uh, fundamental quantities. And from there, that base unit 
for convenience sake, can be changed by use of a prefix. So prefixes convert our base units into units that are really appropriate for the item being measured and for reporting in a normal way those numbers. If you have something that has a ton of particles in it, you might use something like giga or mega, which you should be familiar with from computer terms and kilo. When you deal with something that's much smaller, then we want parts of the base unit, like deca, centa, milla. We'll also see micro and nano and pico and femto throughout the course of the year. The ones we tend to use most often are really these in that range. And every once in a while, we'll see some of these smaller ones. Uh, but typically, kilo, deca, centa, and milla are the ones that we're going to use most often. Now, volume would be an example of a derived unit. Um, typically, we think of volume in terms of liters, but really it's a length, width, and height. And that's easy to see when you're looking at something like a cube. So um, volume really should be some sort of cubic length type unit. And since meter is our fundamental unit of length, if we're talking about volume in SI units, we really have to be in meters cubed. Now the problem is that's a relatively large number. I mean, if you picture a meter cube, you're looking at the size of a washing machine. Um, that's not convenient for a lot of measurements. And meter cubed is also a confusing unit. So we've abbreviated a decimeter cubed to be a liter, because a decimeter cubed is a much more normal type of volume. So now we're dealing with, you know, uh, basically a cube that is about the length of your index finger on each side. And that's a more normal amount. And to get rid of the decimeter cube part and make it less confusing, we call it the liter. And a milliliter would then be a thousandth of a liter. And in terms of cubic units, it would be a centimeters cubed, is really what a milliliter is. So if you hear someone refer to CC, which is uh, often something you hear in medical terms, that really is the same thing as a milliliter. Cubic centimeters is CC. So a liter is a cube one, diam or one uh, decimeter long on each side, and a millimeter would be a cube that's one centimeter long on each side. Another common derived or complex unit would be density. Density is the ratio of the mass over the volume of a substance. And we're going to use this continuously throughout the course of the year. Another measuring um, unit that we're going to use quite often is temperature. And we need to mention a few things about temperature, because there's three fundamental temperature scales, Kelvin, Celsius, and the one we're most familiar with, which would be Fahrenheit. Hopefully, Celsius and Kelvin you're very familiar with uh, from previous years of science. By definition, temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of particles in a sample. So it's related to the kinetic energy. If you remember from last year, kinetic energy is the measure of motion. And it's really derived or dependent upon two things, the mass of the moving particle and the velocity of the moving particle. And as we change uh, particle speed, we're not really changing its mass. So often we equate temperature really with how fast the particles are moving in a sample. Now, temperature is, in scientific measurements, uh, typically Celsius and Kelvin. Those are the sales, uh, scales we're going to use most often. And typically, when we're doing math, that pretty much locks us into Kelvin, because at 0 degrees Celsius, you can get colder. 0 degrees Fahrenheit, you can get colder. But at 0 Kelvin, that would mean when molecular motion stops. So really, the only temperature scale that's truly proportional to the speed of the molecules would be Kelvin. Now, Celsius scale is actually based upon properties of water. Zero is the freezing point of water. 100 is the boiling point of water. Uh, so Celsius derived a thermometer. And when he set up his units, he decided zero would be based upon when water freezes, and 100 would be based upon when water boils. Now, the Kelvin uh, temperature is the SI unit of temperature. And when we're dealing with uh, mathematical relationships, this is the one we're typically going to use. Kelvin is the SI unit of temperature, and it's based upon the properties of gases. Uh, there are no negative Kelvin temperatures. So at zero, molecular motion has stopped. There, it's a theoretical impossibility to reach zero, but not only can you not get to zero, but you can't get below that. And the conversion between the two, which is something you'll often be doing, because typically we measure in the lab temperatures in degrees Celsius, so you typically see temperatures and problems in degrees Celsius. To get to Kelvin, you have to add 273.15. The Fahrenheit scale is really something uh, that we don't use 
almost ever. I doubt you'll see a single temperature or have to do conversions between the two. Um, the calculation is 1.8 times a degree Celsius plus 32. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, that's something you'll probably never have to calculate. One plus to the Fahrenheit scale, though, is um, a change in degree Celsius. It's a much bigger actual temperature than a change in degree Fahrenheit. So technically, the Fahrenheit scale is a little bit more responsive to temperature changes than the degree Celsius scale is. So you can say it's a little bit more precise. And then going backwards, subtract your 32 and multiply by 5 nights. Next section deals with the uncertainty in measurement. And here's where significant digits and accuracy and precision are going to come up. Now, different measuring devices have different uses and different degrees of precision. You're going to end up using a variety of devices this year. I'm not sure if you ever saw or used a volumetric flask last year um, or a pipetter. I know you've used a burette and I know you've used a graduated cylinder, but you'll be using and have to be familiar with and are responsible for understanding the proper use of a number of different devices than you used in your previous years of science. Now accuracy refers refers to the proximity of a measurement to the true value. So when you're saying is it accurate, you're asking is the measurement to within uncertainty a valid measurement? Is it close to what the true value is supposed to be? And people often confuse that with precision, but after having a year of Pre-AP chemistry, I think the difference between these two will be very minimal. Precision refers to the proximity of several measurements uh, to each other. So precision is always about multiple measurements. Accuracy can be about one measurement to the true value or another measurement to the true value. But the two measurements themselves are not compared. Other than to say one would be accurate, one would not. With precision, you have to have multiple measurements. Now, how do you make a measurement? Uh, with most measuring devices, you should be able to, able to estimate to one decimal place more than the smallest division. It's something you should have used uh, quite a bit last year in pre-AP. Um, we're just continuing on the same basic idea. So when you look at a device, the first thing you do is figure out what the smallest division is. In this case, in terms of centimeter, since the numbers represent centimeters, the smallest division would be a tenth of a centimeter. So we can do one decimal place better than that, which is a hundredth of a centimeter, which would be two decimal places. So when you're using this, this device, you should get numbers like 1.24, 2.68, and so on. So just as a quick measurement, go ahead and pause the tape real quick here and go through for these three measurements. Tell me what you think the measurements are. First one should have gone to like approximately 1.94 degrees Celsius, somewhere in the 1.92 to 1.9596 range is probably where most people would be at. Second one, 3.00 key there is two decimal places, must go to two with that device. Now the bottom one, since the nearest division and the smallest division is the nearest one centimeter, we can only estimate to the tenths of a centimeter. So 1.4, 1 1.5, 1.6, somewhere in there. When you go to use volume measuring devices, it's fundamentally the same thing, but be very careful with volume measuring devices. Um, all of these read the same way. Notice the numbering is going up, but you're going to use some measuring, uh, measuring devices like a burette this year where the numbers go the opposite way. You have to really pay close attention to that. So be very careful when you're using other measuring devices besides pipettes and graduated cylinders, which is what you're looking at here. Once again, pause the tape real quick and go through and take a look to see what these measurements are to see if you can make a valid measurement with each device. First one should have been 5.3 or 7.3. Second one, nearest smallest division is 1, so you can go to a tenth, 3.0. And the last one, the smallest measurement is the tenth, so you should go to hundreds, so two decimal places, about 0.35 in this case. Remember, you're reading from the bottom of the dip of the meniscus. And remember, that would be the very bottom. That's how the device is designed to read. So you're in that range with these two. So be careful using volume measurement. Sig figs. All the known digits plus the estimated digit are significant. In other words, they're not placeholders. They were actually a part of the measurement. They're not just there to tell you where the decimal is. When you measure the volume of cylinder one on the last slide, we got 5.5. 73. Now, you might have gotten 5.74, but if you did it appropriately, you should have gotten very close to this measurement. Now, the 5 and the 7, everybody should have had those two. Those are known digits. It's clearly above the 5 and less than the 6, clearly above the 0.7 and not to the 0.8. 
but the estimated digit is where we get some variance, and that brings in uncertainty. But all three of those digits were valid parts of the measurement. It was estimated, but it was a valid estimate. So we would have three significant digits. And significant digits are really a way for us to interpret and to be more careful with numbers. Um, in class this year, you're going to have a little bit more leeway with significant digits than you had last year. Um, and that's because in some ways, significant digits are probably not as important as we, we may be stressed last year. But it is a very convenient way for us to be careful when we're doing calculations with numbers. Now, when you look at these two graduated cylinders, in both cases, you'd say, oh, it looks like it's around 120 milliliters. But there is a difference between these two devices. The device on the right, the smallest division is to the nearest tens, so that means we should estimate to the nearest ones. So that zero needs to be significant. So on the left, the first two are, um, or I should say the first one is the only known digit. The two is estimated, and the zero, that's just a placeholder. And the one on the right, the one and the two were both known digits, and only the last one was estimated. Well, that estimated digit is a valid digit, so it needs to be significant. And that decimal can help us tell somebody that that zero is significant. One thing to keep in mind, if you ever have trouble with significant digits and reporting them accurately, put it in scientific notation. If you won't have any trouble getting an accurate representation of how many sig figs it should appropriately have. Now, the term significant figure really refers to the digits that were measured. Now, when rounding calculated numbers, we have to pay attention to significant digits so we don't overstate the accuracy of our answers. And that's really what significant figures are all about. It's for when we get into calculations, how can be we, we be more careful so we get an accurate description of the answer? Rules. All non-zero digits are significant. Zeros between two significant figures are themselves significant. Zeros at the beginning of a number are never significant. Zeros at the end of a number are significant if a decimal point is written in the number. So zeros at the end count if there is a decimal. Zeros at the beginning never count. Now, the key really is when you get into doing calculations, because so far everything we've looked at is just a repeat of last year. These two types of calculations are going to be a repeat of last year as well. When you're adding or subtracting, the answer is rounded to the least significant decimal place, which is sometimes referred to as the biggest uncertainty. When you look at these three numbers, your calculator is going to spit out 544.12. But that first one is uncertain in the tenths, the second one is uncertain in the hundredths, and the third one is uncertain in the tens. Remember, the answer must be rounded to our least significant measurement here, which is or a decimal place, which in this case is the tens column. So we have to round at that four, and the appropriate answer would be 540 meters. Multiplication division is a little bit easier because all you're really doing is counting. You round the number to the least measurement with the least number of significant digits. So when we plug them in the calculator, we get that with appropriate units. The top one has five sig figs. The bottom one has three. So we round to three significant digits. So we guarantee that our answer to within uncertainty of the number will be accurate. So in this case, we're going to round it to six. That would give us three significant digits. Remember, the zero can't count here. And that's going to approximately mean 2,860 plus or minus 10. And that plus or minus 10 should put this number within reason of our true value. Now, one thing that they started doing last year in a, or in honors chemistry, so this is something that this year is going to be more familiar, so hopefully the transition is a little bit easier. When you do logarithms, you're messing with the numbers. And we have to take that into account in terms of sig figs. And the basic idea is, however many significant digits our base number had, when we take the log of that base number, we round to that many decimal places. So in the first situation here, 3.000 times 10 to the fourth has four sig figs. We should go to four decimal places. So the 4 in the 4.4771 really is not a significant number. It's the 0 .4771 that represents significance. And the second one, since our number only had one significant digit, we have to round to one decimal place. Now, when taking anti-logs, in other words, we're going in the opposite direction, you look at how many decimal places and convert that into that number of significant digits. So 0 .301 has three decimal places that would mean three sig figs, whereas 0 .30 only has two, so you would go to two significant digits. Now, here's a real important one, because this is one that you probably weren't quite as careful about last year, because it really didn't happen 
all that many times. But it happens all the time in AP calculus or in AP chemistry. And that's really when you're looking at dealing with math when you go through a whole series of different calculations, which is pretty common in AP Chem. If a calculation involves a combination of mathematical operations having different significant figures, it's customary, it is a customary practice to carry out the calculation using all figures. In other words, you don't round. Through every step, you keep an unrounded answer in your calculator, and then you go back and evaluate the number of significant digits in each section to see how that limits what the final number of significant digits is. So basically, you use unrounded numbers until you're done. And then you go back and evaluate to where you should round it to. So in this particular calculation, we're adding two numbers, then we're dividing by 42.6, and then we're subtracting from that quantity 1.414 times 10 to the negative third. Now, if you perform this in your calculator without doing any rounding, your final answer is going to look like this. So it may vary slightly depending on how many decimal places there, the calculator actually shows. But essentially, this is what you should get if you don't round anywhere in the course of this problem. Now, what we're going to do is break the calculation to pieces to do our evaluation. So now, here the insignificant figures from the calculator are shown in parentheses. So when we take 6.378 plus 0 0.0025, and we evaluate by sig figs where we should round, that 5 really shouldn't be there. We should have rounded it to 6.380. Now, the 5 is there in the calculator, and it's going to be a part of our measurement, but we need to evaluate. What we really have here is that number. Now, we're taking that number, which really only had 4 sig figs, and we're di dividing by 42.6. Four, uh, uh, three, yeah, four sig figs and three sig figs, we should be limited to three. So now everything after the nine is insignificant. So at this point, we're down to three sig figs. And then in the last step here, we're doing a subtraction. And remember, when you subtract, you look at where it's uncertain, and you're rounding to the biggest uncertainty. Well, this one has an uncertainty here. This one has an uncertainty there. We should be rounding it to three decimal places. That's why we're stopping right there, basically. So that tells us our answer should end up being 0.149. Oops, I'm sorry. It should be 0.148 uh, because its next digit is a 3 past the 8. So your reported answer is going to end up being 0 0.148. So that's what I mean. You, you do it in your calculator, leave all of the significant digits through all of your calculations, and then when you're done, evaluate where you should have ended up. Now, word about sig figs. Significant figures are really a basic means for scientists to provide a measurement of precision to the numbers that they're using. The rounding process involved still introduces a measurement of error into the numbers, however. And in very high-level computations, there are other st statistical methods that get used besides sig figs. Um, significant figures in many situations are basically done in a slightly different way when you're dealing with very large bat ca batch calculations. So we use it as basically kind of a bookkeeping tool to give us a rough idea about what the answer should be so that it's guaranteed to be as precise as possible while still being accurate. And that's really how we use significant digits. So the rules are really just a systematic way to roughly account for errors and improve the accuracy of calculated values. That's really what we're trying to do with significant digits. Because significant figure rules are really just an estimate of precision, you're going to get a little room for error. So the way we're going to grade it this year is your answer is going to be OK if it's within plus or minus 1 at the last significant digit. So if by sig figs rules, we should have gotten 14.2. I'll also accept 14.1 and 14.3. You need to have the right number of significant digits. And you get a little leeway in that last decimal place. So if you didn't leave all of the unrounded numbers in, you might end up with a slight variance. That would still be OK as long as the variance didn't get too large. So that's that's basically the rule as we're going to use it. So just like last year, but when you're doing multiple step calculations, leave your answers unrounded, and then at the end, round to appropriate significant digits. Now, next thing is dimensional analysis. We use dimensional analysis really as a way to convert one quantity in, into another. And it's a tool we use a lot in AP chemistry. And not just for changing units, which is very, very, very routine. Last year in pre-AP, yes, sometimes the question was milliliters, and you really had to be in liters. But that really didn't happen near as much. It's almost all the time. So watch your units, watch your units, watch your units. Consistently be careful of your units in AP chemistry.
Most common uh, dimensional analysis utilize, utilizes what's known as conversion factors. So they're really a quality is expressed as a ratio. So if one inch equals 2.54 centimeters, as a conversion factor, as a ratio of two equivalent numbers, we can write that in one of two ways. One inch over 2.54 centimeters or 2.54 centimeters over one inch. They're both valid expressions of that equality as a conversion factor, but they serve two different purposes. The first one converts centimeters to inches. The second one converts inches to centimeters. So use the form of the conversion factor that puts the sought for unit in the numerator. Remember the thing on top. So what we're trying to get rid of, that goes on the bottom. The unit we're desiring goes on top. So that's going to determine which way you use a particular equality. Since a conversion factor is a ratio of two equivalent values, remember, conversion factors always equal one. In essence, all we're doing is arriving at two numerically equal values or equivalent values. But the reason why the numbers are different is because the units are different. So for example, if we want to convert meters to centimeters and we had 8.00 meters, we would use a conversion factor that there's 100 centimeters in a meter. We want to get rid of meters so that goes on bottom. We want centimeters so that goes on top. Now, if we were trying to get to inches, however, we wouldn't be done at that point. So we need to use another conversion factor. In this case, the conversion, uh, the equality between centimeters and inches. And we'd end up with 315 inches. Remember, these two things are equivalent to each other. So 8.00 meters does equal 315 inches. All of the things we're multiplying by, these equalities that we call conversion factors, really are versions of one. So that's why these two do equal each other. What you start with and what you end with are equivalent to each other. Now, a couple other things to be aware of with dimensional analysis. One would be when messing with exponential units. So let's say we're converting from meters cubed to centimeters cubed. Just because one meter equals 100 centimeters does not mean that 100 meters cubed equals 100 centimeters cubed. Be careful of that. To maintain the equality, the numbers as well as the units must be cubed. So it's true that one meter equals 100 centimeters. That's a valid conversion factor. But that's a conversion factor with units and numbers when dealing with 100 centimeters and one meter, not cubed units. So how many centimeters or cubic centimeters would equal how many cubic meters? Well, it's 100 cubed over one cubed. So you can set the problem up this way if you don't want to write 100 centimeters over one meter three times. Another thing you need to be aware of is complex units. You dealt with this a little bit. You're going to see it significantly more this year in AP Chemistry. Any unit that's a ratio of units is actually an equality and can be used as a conversion factor. So rates and densities and Avogadro's number, all those things are examples of complex units. You know, 9.8 meters per second, 2.5 gram per centimeter cube, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole. They're all what we call complex units. They're a ratio of two equivalent things based upon the way it's expressed. It's 9.8 meters is equivalent to every one second of time. So 9.8 meters of travel is the equivalent of one second of time, and vice versa. So what is the volume of 6.5 kilogram object with a density of 2.5 grams per centimeters cubed? Well, remember, grams per centimeters cubed as a complex unit is an equality. 2.5 grams is equivalent to one centimeters cubed. So if we were into grams, we could get to centimeters cubed. So first we get from kilograms to grams, and then we can use our complex unit as a conversion factor, and we can see we end up with 2,600 centimeters, which is the same as 2,600 milliliters. Remember, a centimeters cubed is the same as a milliliter. And that is the end of chapter one. Remember to pick up your next set of notes um, for chapter two.